this, uh, it's a pleasure to introduce Alex Liu uh, from Cambridge University. Uh, Alex did his undergraduate and PhD in uh, Cambridge, working with Martin Brazier. And uh, Mar Martin put uh, two students, one working on uh, sedimentology stratigraphy and Alex working on, um, on uh, paleontology on Avalon uh, in, uh, in uh, Eastern uh, Canada. And so part of what Alex will talk today is based on this research that he continues. After PhD, he did a postdoc at uh, uh, Cambridge University with uh, Nick Butterfield. And when he followed with independent uh, fellowship at the University of Bristol and started in Cambridge in 2016, I believe. So he expanded his interest now in addition to the current, he actively works on Cambrian. So with this, I uh, let you, Alex, take over. Excellent. Thank you very much, Andre. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming along today. And Andre asked me to give this talk a couple of weeks ago, and it fits quite nicely with Mary Joseph's talk from a couple of weeks uh, ago when she went through the Ediac Combiator of South Australia. What I'd like to do really is give you an overview of what comes before that in terms of the biological record and the environmental record, so that you can see exactly how this all fits together. And I'll also towards the end be touching on some of the environmental events that happened in late Ediac when the Shuram event and the Gaskias glaciation, and the sorts of links that we can start to make on the basis of recent data with the biology and those events. So I would like to start by just giving you a very brief overview of the Ediacrin biota. Um, you're all very familiar with this. What are the Ediacrin microbiota? Well, they're a group of soft-bodied or largely soft-bodied organisms that exist between 574 to 539 million years in age, although there are a few that seem to extend up into the earliest Cambrian. And they inhabit a range of marine depositional environments. Um, in their initial discoveries, they were thought to be a variety of different animal taxa. Silaka's views in the mid to late 1980s suggested that instead they might be more closely related to each other as an extinct clade than to modern animal groups. And that has led to a debate which is still rumbling on in terms of what these organisms are. I think Silaka's views are largely outdated now, although there are some adherence to them still. But by looking at these fossils on a case-by-case -case basis, progress is being made in terms of determining what each of these organisms are. You'll be very familiar with taxa such as Dickinsonia and Sprigina down here from Mary Joseph's talk and the fossils of South Australia and to a certain extent the White Sea of Russia, which also has things like Dickinsonia. These are all organisms that appear around 560 million years ago. What you might be less familiar with are frond-like taxa from what we call the Avalon biota, and they predate these fossils and they stretch back to around 574 million years in age. And they'll be the focus of this talk. So trying to answer the question of what were the Ediac and macro biota, well, in recent years, there's been a variety of developmental, uh, ethnological, and in this case, biomarker studies, which have all independently provided evidence that certain members of the Yacrin biota were animals of some sort. We haven't yet got to the stage where we can assign these things to specific phyla, but the consensus is that certainly some animals were present, and it's likely that some of those were bilaterian in order to produce a diverse trace fossil record. That we see. In terms of uh, the wider Ediacan bites, I'm sorry this slide is slightly fuzzy. This is a couple of images taken from Drew Macenti's paper in 2019, where if you look at all of the different Ediacan macrofossil taxa and um, look at them in terms of a cluster analysis, what you find is that they fall into a variety, or the locations they come from fall into a variety of assemblages. And these biotic assemblages, traditionally Ben Wagoner found three. Uh, Drew's paper suggests that there's this fourth Meowha cluster, 
they seem to have similar taxa inhabiting similar locations around the world. And so this network analysis here, you can see these color coded circles indicating that individual taxa within these assemblages seem to cluster closely with each other. And there is some overlap, but not a huge amount across locations. The one to look out for is this blue one here, the Avalon biota. And that's largely based around the United Kingdom, uh, Newfoundland in Eastern Canada, and Northwest Canada even sites um, from the Rocky Mountains. And there's a big discussion ongoing still about what these represent. Some have suggested that they are environmentally driven. So each of these different biotas inhabiting different locations or environmental setting on an Ediacaran marine slope. So the Avalon biota in that model, uh, favoured by people like Dima Grushdankin in 2011, would suggest that the Avalon type biotas are largely found in deep water settings, whereas these younger um, Nama and Miaoha biotas tend to occur in shallow water settings. Others have suggested that there might be a taphonomic reason for these differences, and still others have noticed that there seems to be also a temporal control to these, with the Avalon biota locations often being older than those of the White Sea and the Nama. And that is certainly the case. And if we look in this blue box here at the Avalon biota, you can see that when compared to the White Sea and Nama assemblages, it is far less diverse in terms of these morpho groups of different types of Ediacaran organisms we see. It's dominated by frond-like forms known as either Rangiomorphs or Arboreomorphs. And they extend back to much older ages than any of the other sites. And so we're going to spend this talk looking at the variety of organisms found within these settings. Traditionally, these have been seen very much as fond dominated deep water communities. What I'd like to try and convince you of today is that actually there's far more diversity within them. And they are not just deep water settings. There are shallow water assemblages within these that are of interest. So we're focusing largely on these three locations. Kina Bond's group have done most of the work in Northwest Canada in finding these fossils more recently with people like Francis MacDonald and describing these from places such as the Nadaline Formation. Um, the UK sites are where these fossils were first described. Um, Charnia Masoni being the most famous and iconic of these from Leicestershire, Charnwood Forest in Leicestershire in the 1950s. And Chania is a beautiful example of what we call a Rangiomorph frond. So these are leaf-like organisms that are comprised of a series of self-similar repeated modular units. And you can see this along the length of the individual branches in Chania. You can see that each branch is comprised of a smaller branch, and those are comprised of smaller branches still, which are very similar in their morphology. These are attached quite frequently to circular structures at their base called disks. And these holdfast disks are thought to have been anchoring these organisms to the seafloor. This one here in C is a nice example of one of the first to be uh, reported in the 1840s, not in a scientific paper, but in a communication between some Leicestershire doctors uh, who had gone to a quarry and noticed these strange impressions on the surfaces. This is actually from the same surface as the Chania holotype and predates that significantly. In North America, the first fossils to be described were these, again, discoidal structures called Aspidella from Newfoundland in the 1870s um, by Billings, Elkana Billings. And so we've got quite a long history of research into these structures. However, well, what I'd like to focus on mostly in this talk are specimens from Newfoundland in Canada. And here we're blessed by having a huge number of extensive bedding plains exposed along the coastline. There's a person, Jack Matthews, there just for scale. You can see that these are often tennis court size or larger, and typically they can preserve spectacular assemblages of fossils. So if you're lucky, you can find four to 5,000 specimens on individual bedding plains like this. These all outcrop along the coastline. Um, not every single one has fossils. Modern weathering has unfortunately removed the fossils from a large number of these, 
But in a stretch of coastline of around 200 metres like this, this is Mistaken Point on the southeastern coast of, Mr. of Newfoundland, you would find or expect to find maybe 10 to 15 surfaces which will have some sort of fossil uh, structure on them. And maybe one or two of those will be well enough preserved to be amenable to study. And when they are well preserved, what you see are these beautiful impressions. This is something called fact of users misery of organisms impressed into the surfaces of these fine grained siltstones and mudstones. Mistaken Point Ecological Reserve is the main fossil site you're probably familiar with. That's now a World Heritage Site. The second site where we find a lot of these structures is actually here on the Bonavista Peninsula of Newfoundland, and you'll hear me talking about that quite a bit in this talk, um, on something called the Catalina Dome, this antiformal structure where we have the Druk Formation in the middle, and then everything as we move out in any direction through the towns of Little Catalina, Catalina, Port Union and Melrose is getting younger and expressing a variety of other fossils. This was originally found by um, Sean O'Brien and Art King as part of Newfoundland Geological Survey's mapping uh, surveys and was nicely described by Hans Hoffman along with those authors in 2008. In terms of looking for these fossil surfaces, uh, the Hoffman paper was brilliant in describing these for the first time and listed around 40 different fossil surfaces around the Bonavista Peninsula. Our exploration since then have found around the same number in addition to those. And some of these can be extensive like this, which is something called LC6, where we have beautiful preservation of a number of taxa, maybe 15 or 20. Others can be extremely small. So here we have PU22, this is near the town of Port Union. And it's literally these two small blocks here which don't look like they would be very productive at all, but do actually have very nicely preserved facts of users' fossils upon them. So when we're exploring for these sites, it's a case of really looking at every single surface and trying to see what it might have, because even if the surface is not good for large-scale populational studies, it might have preservational detail. This is good enough for us to see individual unusual details within some of these specimens. In terms of how these fossils are preserved, these are very planar laminated or planar bedded, sorry, um, turbiditic sequences from the Druk formation all the way up to the Fumuse formation. All we see really is a variation in bed thickness and occasional sandstones being brought in. But most of these are Balmer sequence turbidites. And you can see here a nice typical example where you have the graded beds towards the bottom, and then your convolute cross laminate moving up through parallel laminate siltstones and then this green mottled hemipelagite sitting on top which is the background sedimentation upon which the fossils are impressed. Above that we often see either a tuff, a volcanic tuff, or some sort of volcanoclastic sediment and it's the weathering of these volcanoclastic sediments off these surfaces in Newfoundland which allows us to see these bedding planes being exposed in the detail that we see. There's a variety of different ways in which we, we can preserve these fossils. Um, the two most common are as lower surface impressions where the organism has been lying on what we assume was a microbially covered surface. Um, it's been buried by ash. That ash has then collapsed in to replicate the lower surface of the organism. That's typically seen in fossils like Fractifusus. And then death mask or upper surface, similar to what we see in Australia, where it seems to be the top surface of the organism which has been uh, replicated. And so there seems to have been some mineralization of that upper surface prior to lithification of the sediment, which has then allowed the lower bed to seep in to fill the space vacated by the decaying organism. When we look at thin sections through these beds, what we find is that there's often this black veneer of mineralization at the interface between the bed on which the fossils are preserved and the volcanoclastic sediments or tuff, which has smothered them. And this is common on a variety of surfaces. And when we look at that under the micro probe, what we often see are these flamboidal textures comprising those black veneered surfaces. Often these are iron oxides, but in cases we do find that they are pyritic. Um, and we assume that these oxidized ones were also originally pyritic. And there's even examples 
such as from this surface LC6 again, which I showed you earlier, where there are pyrite cores to these oxidized rim um, framboidal structures. So in Newfoundland, at least, we're fairly confident that pyrite seems to have played some sort of role in this early mineralization of the surfaces, both the fossils and the organisms themselves and the surrounding bedding plates. To give you an overview now of the types of fossils that we see, um, the most common, I'd say 75% of all of the different taxa we see, and maybe as much as 90% of individual organisms on the bedding plain, are either rangimorphs or arboreomorphs, what we refer to as frondose taxa. These are two seemingly unrelated groupings of organisms that have evolved convergently on a frond-like morphology. The rangimorphs, a nice example of which is, is here, this is something called Bradgatia, and this is just one frond within a much larger cabbage-shaped organism where there's lots of leaves to the, the organism. Here you can see quite clearly how this large branch here is comprised of smaller branches which are at every scale self-similar, and so you have this very feathery structure. And this is really characteristic of rangimorph taxa. On the other hand, we have arboreomorphs, such as Chani viscus here, where we have the same type of leaf-like structure, but each individual branch, and you can see that they are bilaterally uh, arranged around this central axis of this front here. Each branch does not have finer scale structure that is self-similar to the original branching. And that is our main diagnostic criterion on which to distinguish these. So these frond-shaped fossils are amongst the oldest and longest lived and most environmentally tolerant of Ediacaran fossils. We find them in these Avalonian sites, the oldest we know of are older than 574 million years in age. And we also find similar forms, particularly of rangimorphs, such as Rangia itself, in Namibia, so way up around 540 million years. So some of these taxa are considerably long lived. To give you a few insights into recent work that's been done on this, I want to use a Chania masoni, um, that first Ediacaran fossil we found from the Avalon Ranges, um, as a nice case study. And this is all work led by Frankie Dunn, now a postdoc at the Oxford University Museum of Natural History, formerly my PhD student in Bristol. And her project was looking at developmentally at these frondose organisms and trying to look for new characters with which we might be able to say something about how they relate to modern organisms. So Frankie's work originally started with a paper that was looking mainly at the anatomy of Charnia specimens. This was looking not just at specimens from the United Kingdom, but also things from Newfoundland, where we see quite a lot of examples of, of Charnia, and also beautifully preserved three-dimensional specimens from the White Sea of Russia, uh, alongside and in collaboration with Dima Grestankin. And what she was first able to do was resolve the way in which these branching, branching patterns are arranged at a finer scale. We'd known for quite a long time about how these first order branches relate to the second order branches, which sort of hang down from them. But third and fourth order branching had never really been observed in enough detail for us to be able to see exactly what was going on. And so here in some of these beautifully preserved Russian specimens, you can actually see from, this is a mold of, of those specimens, you can see the third order branches are actually displayed in terms of their rangimorph elements. And the fourth order ones branch off from theirs and are also displayed in this specimen. And in a cartoon-like uh, version of this, there's quite a lot of variation within these Chania specimens. The amount of display, that is, whether you can see both sides of an individual Chani branch or furling, which is where you sort of fold in the edges of those branches, and then rotation where you've actually folded them over so you're only seeing really one of those sides of each branch. Those are then typically used as characteristic diagnostic characters to distinguish between different Rangimov species in general. So what Frankie has been able to show is that although Amongst all Charnias around the world, the first and second order branches seem to be consistent in the way that they're expressed across all of those organisms. The third and fourth order branching often has a little bit more variation to it. 
She also recognized new features, uh, these lateral branches here on the edges of the first branch of Achania. Those hadn't been described before and seem to be something that indicates a very early stage in the growth of these Charnia organisms. And she also noticed that there seemed to be sympodial arrangements of growth in terms of the growth axis of each of these branches. How new branches are added is not a longer monopodial central stem, but being derived from the previous branch. And so you can see here that this gives you a slightly different arrangement to how these are structured. She then had a follow-up paper earlier this year where we were able to CT scan um, and synchrotron scan some of these three-dimensional Russian specimens. And the interesting thing here is that that sympodial growth axis was confirmed. So here is a, a nice example of one of these Chania specimens, and she's highlighted several of these individual second-order branches, taken a slice, CT slice, through these branches and you can see that there's actually no space at all or no internal structure for any central stem. I know this is a slightly fuzzy image because I've blown it up from the original paper, but there's no indication at all of a central stem moving through that axis. Now, this is interesting because Charnia seems to be growing in this sympodial fashion and arrangement. Other Rangi morphs clearly do have stem-like structures running through the center of them. And so there seems to be variation in the way that these rangiomorphs and different taxa within them are growing. And so Frankie's been looking at homologies between these different rangiomorph taxa and is investigating that as part of her postdoc. The other very useful thing she did in that 2021 paper was for the first time try to put Charnia into a phylogenetic analysis. And so using Bayesian approaches and a character matrix, including a variety of u metasomes and things like placosomes, peripherans, and coanoflagellates as our L group. She was able to score 178 characters. She was able to score Charnia for 80 of those and resolved it, regardless of the arrangements of all of these basal groupings of metasomes. Charnia always came out as a stem group u metasome. And so that is quite a significant finding in terms of our attempts to understand what these Frondose organisms are. So it's a combination of morphological and developmental characters that have been used to enable her to do this, but it is important in taking us one step further in our understanding of these fonts. If correct, this would indicate that e-metasomes were present with the first Rangiomorph taxa. The first Charnia we see is at 574 million years ago. And so this pushes back our understanding of the evolution of these major groups. I mentioned that there's a second group of Fondo's organisms. Uh, those are the Arboreomorphs. And in Newfoundland, they're largely um, um, represented by something called Charnio discus. We actually also studied another different type of arboreomorph, Arborea itself, in South Australia and the collections there alongside Jim Galing in 2019. And Frankie did a similar developmental and morphological analysis on this and again found some interesting features. Arborea is a beautiful uh, unipolar front or uniterminal front, i.e. an organism with just one single front emanating from a stem and a disc. One of the first things we recognized is that these discs were a very variable size related to their parent fronts. And there are even examples such as this one down in E, where it looks like there seems to be a hole in the side of this disc and sediment is splayed out in a little delta fan shape from that um, structure. That seems to indicate to us that these were fluid filled uh, structures and that if they burst, then fluid would flow out of them. That would also explain their ability to, to increase and inflate or deflate in terms of their size. Frankie was able to confirm alongside previous work by Mark Laflamme published the previous year on similar specimens that these are not uh, showing ranging or crunching. They're showing a very different type of crunching where you have a sort of protective sheath in front of the rows of branches, and then the individual branches will sit within this and they don't really have Rangiomorph type branching within them either. 
And then perhaps the most important of the, the new observations was that when we looked at the central axes, the central stems of these fronds, you can see each branch coming off here. If we zoom in on those, you can see that we have a series of tubes running down the axis of this stem. And those tubes branch off in a one-to-one -one relationship with individual branches on the side of the organism. So this is something called fascicled branching. Um, this is an example of it in colonial hydroids, extant hydroids. And so it's something that a variety of taxa have, but it's often seen in colonial and clonal in terms of their biology organisms. And so as well as suggesting that this is a modular um, construction to these organisms um, in line with previous studies, what this suggests is that actually there's differentiation of tissues. There are not organs per se, but structures within this organism that have a different tissue composition and a different function to other tissues that are surrounding that. So tissue differentiation was a key character recognized in Arborea in this study. Here's another example of a, a stem running up to the corner of the image here. And you can see an individual branch and another one here. And again, you can see this tubular arrangement of structures that seems to be a composite impression of internal morphology that's been preserved within the sandstones of the Ediacal number in these specimens. So beautiful material and both the arboreomorphs and the rangiomorphs on the basis of these studies seem to suggest that we're dealing with eumetazoans in these assemblages. Now, just to touch upon Mary's talk a couple of weeks ago, um, she was describing all of the, the fossils from the Flinders ranges and um, they have a much more diverse array of specimens. They also have a much coarser grained uh, sedimentology to all of the beds on which they find these. And so in 2016, when one of Jim's students, Felicity Coots, published this paper, looking at all of the very tiny specimens that they'd found on this block from the Ediacara Conservation Park, it sort of spurred us on into thinking, well, how small can the specimens be that we find preserved in Newfoundland? And so here, I've been showing you examples of things like Chani discus. This is a disc, a holdfast disc of a typically sized Chani discus. So that specimen is about 30 centimeters in length. And if we look at every one of these white arrows, what you'll see is a, a selection of very tiny little ridges and grooves. Those are all fractal fusus specimens, and they're all smaller than one centimeter in length. Similarly, all of these red arrows are pointing to examples of Chaniodiscus specimens. Again, only one or two centimetres in length. And so these really small specimens are not found on every single bedding plane, but where we have the best preservation and the finest grain material upon which these uh, fossils are impressed, we do seem to see a lot more in terms of abundance of taxa, abundance of specimens. And we've now got a PhD student, Katie Delahook, who's currently in Newfoundland, uh, she flew out last week, is looking at these small specimens on these bedding claims, and looking at what their, um, their presence means for our understanding of paleoecology, which is typically always focused on the large specimens that are common on many different surfaces. The other thing we found when we looked at a much finer resolution are these thread-like filamentous structures that run across the bedding planes. Here we have another rangimorph specimen beautifully preserved from something we call the MUN surface. And you can see that alongside it, there's these positive relief ridges running along the surface and that they disappear underneath the fossil specimen. What are those? We, had a paper uh, led by Emily Mitchell, who's a postdoc in Cambridge, an independent research fellow here in the Department of Zoology, in 2015, where using spatial statistics and just assessing the spatial patterning of certain fossils on these bedding planes, she was able to suggest that, well, she, she found that there was a clustered um, arrangement to these organisms. So we're looking specifically at this organism here, Fractive User Sandersoni. And she found that they seem to form clusters within these numerical analyses. That would indicate that these double to Thomas cluster patterns suggest, when looking also at the different 
patterns of clustering seen in large, medium and small specimens. Where you can see there's a lot more aggregation in these smaller specimens than in the large ones. That smaller specimens seem to be clustering themselves around larger ones. And she suggested in that paper that there might be stolonic reproduction in these organisms in a similar way to things like strawberry plants today or the modern green alga cowlerpa, where here you can see this nice stolon linking a variety of fronds, um, which we've pulled up out of the sediment so that you can now see all about um, morphology. So this was a 2015 prediction that there might be stolonic structures in uh, Newfoundland. And these filamentous structures then appeared, which we wanted to work out, are they actual evidence, physical evidence for stolons? Well, it seems that they may well be. So here on the LC6 surface, we have a frond, a rangimorph organism, uh, illustrated by this white arrow. And you can see surrounding it, with these white arrows, a variety of filamentous threads. And they're all converging on this yellow region here. This is the whole facet of this frond. They're not randomly oriented on the bedding plane, and they do even change direction to link up with this central point. Um, I'll show you a, a much larger CRISPR image of this here. So you can see all of these structures, and even some finer structures I didn't arrow in that previous image, are all converging on this central point from which this frond is growing. On the same bedding plane, here's another example where we've got two fronds now, and the white arrows are pointing to their hold fast structures where they're attached to the sediment. And you can see here another filament that moves up the screen, zigzags back across and connects those two specimens, and then moves off again to another specimen that's up at the top. Uh, this one goes off for over four meters. To, down towards the bottom corner of the surface. So these are very large structures, and these are filamentous connections between taxa of the same type on these surfaces. So that would be consistent with a stalonic um, um, function for these filamentous structures. We've also found these filaments now, I think we're on around 30 different surfaces around Newfoundland. They can be extremely dense in their abundance on individual surfaces. This is a one centimeter scale bar. And you can see that most of them are smaller than 100 microns or so in their width, but several centimeters or tens of centimeters in length. And we see them connecting to or associated with a variety of taxa. Here's a fractal fusus, and this filamentous structure seems to run into the end of it. Uh, same in this one. Here's another fractal fusus and the arrowed filament is on a trajectory that takes it directly into the end of Frax fusus. Here we have a Chinese discus-like organism, another one here, and both of those are associated with filaments that connect to or are in association with their holdfast structures. So we published this in 2020 and made the suggestion that this is more evidence that there are stolonic reproductive strategies amongst these frondose organisms, which Frankie's previous work has suggested are eumetazone. And so we really are making progress in terms of what these organisms are, how they reproduced, and how they were living. And there's a variety of different researchers, both in Cambridge, in Oxford, and at Memorial University in Newfoundland, who are working now on the paleoecology and taxonomy of these forms. And there's still a lot more to discover from those forms. The one that all of those filaments were attaching to is another example of it. We call this the banana frond. This is a new species as well. So there's, although there's been 30 or 40 years of work in Newfoundland, there are still new taxa to describe. So what I want to do now is show you that it's not just frondose taxa in Newfoundland. There's actually quite a lot more. Um, this is a surface which has lots of those orangimorph fronds on it. It's in the Trapassi formation, which is turbidetic thought to be deep marine in the same way as all of the others in Newfoundland, but it has this very strange ovate structure preserved on it. You can see that there's a, a roughness to the surface surrounding it, and that that disappears underneath this oval structure, and that it has very gentle folds running along the edge of it. There's only one of these. Uh, this is something that I'm looking at at the moment, um, but it seems to have a similar appearance to kelp and, and seaweeds which is interesting given that we should be in a subphotic environment. So 
possible algal fossil within these assemblages. It is, of course, possible that these have been washed in. It doesn't mean that this specimen was actually deposited, well, living in this setting. You can see here some of the fonds uh, oriented in different directions to this. And as most fronds on most surfaces are oriented in the same direction, thought to be by contourite currents or felling currents, it would imply that this different orientation is not necessarily a, an in situ organism. We also have quite unusual organisms, although we're making progress with the Rangiomorphs, there are still problematic structures in Newfoundland. This is something Hans Hoffman et al. describes as Hadrina scala, a ladder like taxon from the Bonavista Peninsula. When he described this, it was worth describing because it was so different to everything else. But it was an incomplete specimen. We never knew what the ends looked like because coastal erosion has taken them away. So we now have a variety of different examples of these where we do see the ends. And so these ladder-like structures converge to a point at either end, uh, nicely seen here in B. And they seem to do this at both ends. There doesn't seem to be any holdfast structure. There doesn't seem to be anything in the middle of the organism. That seems to be a clear space and the filamentous structures you see on either side of it appear again in the middle as if there's nothing actually there. And then within these large scale runs that are moving across the organism, there are much finer scale ones. Um, they're not particularly well shown there. They're in C, you can just about see them, which are almost like whale barley in the way that they're arranged. So these might be filtration structures. They might be something entirely different that we're gradually, with new specimens, learning a bit more about these problematic taxa. We then have things that have been proposed to be metazoan in the past. Um, Thectardis avalonensis is this triangular fossil. There's very little else to it other than this triangular impression on the surfaces. But they're reasonably common, and they're amongst the oldest of the fossils that we find. Again, close to 574 or so million years. They have a body plan noticed by Eric Sperling, Jakob Vint and colleagues as being consistent with the hydrodynamics of a sponge water canal system. They live in subphotic habitats and have different spatial patterns to other common Ediacaran macrofossils when looked at with uh, Emily Mitchell's spatial analysis. That would imply that they are doing something slightly different to all of the other forms. Our main problem with them is that there's so little uh, morphological detail with which we can work to actually work out what these are. But they're certainly an enigma and a sponge remains a possibility for this organism. We also have Heutia quadriformis. We only have two specimens of this so far, although more are being described by the Mun group, I think. And so here we have a central circular structure, which seems to again be a whole fast, something moving from it, which is a ridge, which we think is a stem, and then this rectangular structure, which has a very fibrous um, morphology. Those fibers are arranged in bundles, and they bundle into these structures as are branches or arms almost moving off in a fourfold symmetrical arrangement around the organism, as shown in this cartoon overlay here. And so we've re well, um, reconstructed this organism as a sort of storazoan-like organism, where we have a holdfast, a cup-shaped body, and then these tentacle-like structures would have been used for catching material from the water column. Very difficult to interpret because we only have a few specimens, but the specimens we do have are exceptionally preserved, and so there's a lot of detail to them. It does seem to be something of an Adarian grade. Whether it is an Adarian is, is up for debate, um, but there do seem to be organisms like this alongside those Rangiomorphs in these settings. Then finally, we have trace fossils, evidence of locomotion. And so this is at 565 million years in age. We only have a, one bedding plane in the mistaken point which shows these, but there's around 80 different specimens on that bedding plane, where we have these hemispheric structures in linear arrangements with positive relief sedimentological levees along each side, and then a circular structure at the end. This implies movement of an organism with a circular base along that sedimentary surface prior to deposition of ash-like material. 
We don't know what that organism was. It doesn't appear to be the Fondo's organisms, but something capable of movement does seem to have been present. And its locomotion strategy was similar to that used by modern day sea anemones, which produce very similar trails on the basis of their expansion and contraction of their pedal disc. So everything I've shown you so far comes from deep water settings. We also though have shallow water settings in Avalonia, and what we find here is very different. So the Long Mind in Shropshire um, in the UK is one such example, and here largely what we see are filamentous structures at a very fine scale. These are microbial maps where you can actually see the individual filaments in these fine-grained sediments. We see an abundance of discoidal structures, but these are not holdfasts of, of other organisms, it seems. These are much more densely packed, much smaller in their size. And work by Lathar Menon, one of Martin Brazier's other PhD students, has suggested that these are actually sedimentological structures, fluid escape structures on these surfaces in very shallow marine settings. We also see surfaces in marginal marine settings in Newfoundland, such as in the Fermuse Formation here in Newfoundland, which are covered in discoidal structures, but these are much larger than those fluid escapes. So a debate has been raging for 20 years now, over 20 years, um, since Jim Galing and Guy Narbon and Michael Anderson's paper on these structures. These are Aspidella, the original structures described from Newfoundland. And whether or not they are the holdfasts of other organisms or whether they're something else. So we have a master's student, Alavia Dungana, who's been working on these, looking at their taphonomy and their spatial battening. And what he's found indicates that there's actually a lot of variation within these assemblages. We probably do have fond like holdfasts amongst these communities. They're just being expressed very differently to how we see them in deep water settings. This is backed up by the finding of actual fronds. Uh, these are charnier specimens in amongst some of the assemblages where we find these discs. So this is the youngest examples of fronds that we have in Newfoundland are found only a few meters above these discoidal assemblages. So this is proof that the fronds were still around. They are very much a viable um, possibility for explaining these structures, um, but there's likely to be something else there, whether that is a microbial um, colony origin or whether that's a sedimentological structure, a biological origin. And we also see evidence of linear forms. So this is something called Arambiria, which some of you may be familiar with. And this is a series of ridges and grooves that can be found on very shallow um, and sometimes emergent sediments within the age range of around 580 to 520 million years, often found in red dead successions. And these grooves and ridges can bifurcate. They're always of similar spacing and, and patterning and similar thickness, um, but they don't seem to touch. And any bifurcation always occurs in one direction, as in A here. What we found is recently work done by Will McMahon, or led by Will McMahon, um, and looking at samples of this from Brittany in France. What we found are evidence of very large scale bedding planes, which have 300 square meters of this structure on them. So this is not a metazoan like structure. And also some of these ridges, when they're very finely preserved, we'll zoom in, you can see that they're made up themselves of individual ridges. So filamentous bundles of material that are being preserved and overlapping one another, superimposed on one another. And so our interpretation of this is that it's some sort of algal or microbial, cyanobacterial, for example, community, which has been aligned within our flow. And so what you're seeing are these individual filaments being caught up in the flow and clustered into these little bundles that are moving along the, the surface. So this is about to come out in the next few weeks in Jormac. So to summarise that, in deep water settings in Avalonia, we have lots of fronds, we have possible sponges, possible nidarians, trace fossils. In shallow water settings, we have lots of discoidal assemblages, a variety of mat, microbial matter related fabrics, um, these potential algal and cyanobacterial communities, and 
true microbial maps being preserved in the sediment. The next few slides are really just trying to summarise all of that and put it into context. So if we were to look at other sites around the world of a similar age, so here we have Newfoundland, um, or where it's thought to have been, this is on the Murdeth et al. Continental Reconstruction of 2021. Um, we can see Newfoundland here, and each pie chart represents a different proportion of taxa in those individual locations of different groups. And so these are the morpha groups of Mark Lefam and a few additional ones to reflect uh, more recent data. So in these very oldest EDAP and assemblages, we see that there's very few sites available to us and they're all of the low diversity. Then Newfoundland um, and New Northwest Canada, they're both dominated in this light blue color here by Rangiwalt taxa. As we move forward into the next time bin, what we see is the appearance of Charnwood Forest in the UK with a very similar complement of taxa. And elsewhere in the world, we only have two sites. They both only have one taxon, and both of those are protistan, so paleopascicness, if you're familiar with that. So in these very oldest settings, we have low diversity in terms of large scale groupings. If we move through time, we can see that there is an increase in diversity, but it's not particularly substantial, and it is largely taken up by increased diversity within the Randy Moss. As we then move into the white sea type assemblages here in the, the box shaded out, you can see that there's a huge increase in diversity. And then that declines again as we move into the final 10 million years of Ediacaran, as represented by Nama type assemblages. So that's work that was published earlier this year, uh, led by Catherine Body. But the last few slides I want to pick up on really are how these patterns relate um, in more detail to major environmental events. And so this is focusing on work published, led by Jack Matthews at the University of Oxford. And Jack was going through the mistaken point ecological reserve of Newfoundland, looking at the sedimentology and gathering tuffaceous material for dating. And so he's obtained six radiometric dates through that succession. At the same time, I was collecting data on the individual occurrences of different taxa through that succession. So this is over 10 years of data all plotted here. And this is literally just the stratigraphic ranges of individual taxa with no dating. This is just the thickness of the succession. When we add those dates, uh, this is Jack up here for any of you who don't know him. What we find is that when you put them into an age model, so we have our dated horizons here, um, the E surface, the most famous of these mistaken point surfaces, some of you may be familiar with, is up here in the upper mistaken point region. We get quite a spread within our uh, biostratigraphic ranges of these taxa. And there are patterns that seem to be significant within these. And these patterns are matched in our preliminary data from the Bonavista Peninsula, 300 kilometers away, but the same taxa seem to occur in the same sequence. What we find is that the first organisms to appear around 574 million years ago are what we call uniterminal Langimorphs, those forms which only have one front rather than many fronds or two. Um, growth axes, and they seem to be undisplayed forms. So we're not seeing both sides of every Randy Morse branch in those taxa, only the, the rotated form. It's only later, around 571 million years ago, that we start to see multi-terminal taxa appearing and displayed taxa. And that would suggest that there does seem to be a shift in what these organisms are capable of looking like and, and doing evolutionarily across this interval. For reference, all of the candidate medallions that we have and the trace fossils are around 565 million years old or younger. So they're towards the very top of this figure. Uh, Tectardis, the potential sponge, is down towards the bottom. So this is consistent with our understanding of how these organisms should appear in terms of classical understanding of animal phylogeny. But it's interesting that we see Rangimorphs having patterns within the group themselves of um, appearance of different features within them. The other thing I want to look at is the relationship of all of these to the Shuram. 
And the shuram is something that's often, well, at least when I started my PhD, was not really spoken about in the same sentences as Newfoundland, Ediacaran taxa. And recent dating, particularly that done by Rini et al. in 2020, from Northwest Canada and Amman, has suggested that actually the Shuram excursion is very relevant to all of the taxa we're looking at. This is a figure from their paper, and you've got the Shuram uh, negative isotope carbon anomaly here on the left. You have some dating in the center, and you have these Ediacaran biotas here in the middle. So the Avalon biota overlaps with and is um, at the same time as this Shuram anomaly. So I wanted to look at that in a little bit more detail. So just to remind you of the talk last week from Cedric Hagen, um, he mentioned the Rooney et al. study, and the Rooney et al. study concludes that the Shuram anomaly took place somewhere between 574 and 567 million years in age. Cedric's talk last week suggested that the nadir of that excursion, based on his algorithm methods, was around 571.8 to 570.2 million years ago. Well, it was between those dates. In 2020, there was also another paper published looking at the Shuram and its age, and that was from data in Newfoundland, led by Don Canfield. And this was looking at clastic rock carbonate um, signals. And so here's a figure from their paper, and these are the Newfoundland uh, stratigraphic units that we've been talking about. The Gaskias is a glacial unit, and then the Druk, Briscoe, Mistaken Points, and Trapassi are the ones with all of the Fondos taxa we've just been discussing. So it's getting younger towards the left here. And what you can see is that there is, in their interpretation, the Nadir of Vishura in this interval in the Briscoe to Mistaken Point and Trapassi formations. So they do have radiometric dates, and that those suggest that the Nadir is somewhere between 571 and 562 million. So that's quite a broad range. If we expand that out and add Jack Matthews's dates from that section to this data set, which is not necessarily the most accurate thing to do, but it does add new data from the same stratigraphic units, then we see that we have slightly different uh, dating. So this is what Canfield et al. claimed originally, that Nadir was between 571 and 562. Jack states would suggest that this Nadir, this black interval here on the, the Canfield figure, is actually, can be much more tightly constrained to 567.6 and 564.1 million. So that is an improvement in terms of precision, but is it accurate? Well, we do have a slight problem in that Rooney et al. did consider the Canfield paper, and so you've got Newfoundland's data from that Canfield paper in the Rooney paper. And so we've got Amman and North, Northwest Canada and the possible ranges of the Shuram in those two successions. And this is the Canfield data in pink here. Jack's dates would suggest that that is actually slightly older than where Jack would put the, the units in which this isotope excursion seems to occur at 567 to 564. Now, in terms of trying to work out how this relates to patterns within the biota, um, it's quite significant in that in the Rooney et al. understanding, and, and Cedric Hagen's understanding was very similar to this, the Nadir of the Shuram was somewhere between 574 and 569. That is when we see the first of these Ediacaran taxa appearing in, in Newfoundland that have a very low diversity grouping of organisms. Whereas the Canfield et al. data, when Jack's dates are applied to, to that, would suggest a younger excursion with an idea being actually corresponding to these younger units um, in the mistaken point and Chapassi formations where we see the highest diversity. So it's important that we get this right. And I'm not putting this forward um, to present it as I have one opinion in another direction. I don't. I just think it's worth noting and worth geochemists being aware that there is a discrepancy here within the data sets and that that needs resolving. Um, one thing to note, Cedric did say last week that he noticed a global increase in sedimentation rates at the point of the Shuram anomaly. Um, we do see in our age model 
a very large significant shift in sedimentation rates with most of our sediment being deposited after five, six, seven million years. We have very little of it being deposited in this earlier interval. And that would correlate with the position of the Shuram anomaly in Canfield et al's data. So that seems to be a consistent signal. Why that is, um, is something for others to ponder. And then my final point is relating to the gas gears. So everything else that I've spoken about occurs within these units in, in Newfoundland. So the conception group and St. John's groups, it's younger than the gaseous formation, which is this proposed glacial unit at 580 million years ago. This is from an area of Newfoundland, this stratigraphic column called the St. John's Basin. This is most of the Avalon Peninsula over here and part of the Bonavista Peninsula, just as top northernmost tip. But there is another Ediacaran Age stratigraphic basin um, in Newfoundland, the Bonavista Basin, um, mostly encompassed by this bit here. And here as well, we also see a diamictite, which seems to be evidence for a glacial horizon that is correlative to the gaseous formation, worked by Judy Puetel, dated this in 2016 to be equivalent in age. So from this Bonavista Basin section, you've actually now found Ediacaran type fossils below the gaseous horizon. Now that's something that wasn't or isn't seen um, in the St. John's Basin. Those fossils come from the Bonavista Peninsula in a town called Trinity, and they're all paleopascicness specimens, so these chambered um, organisms forming these linear series moving along the surfaces. They're all very small. You can see from the 10 centimeter scale, sorry, 10 millimeter scale bar here, that they're only around a millimeter in width, each of these chambers, and they're forming chains of around four to five centimeters in length at most. Here's our stratigraphic log, and you can see the Trinity facies here, this diamictite, which has evidence of dropstone striated clasts, clearly indicates a deposition by ice in a submarine basin. And so here we have a seven or eight meters below a horizon with paleopascicness, and another 20 meters below that, another horizon. So there is exam now an example of Ediacrotype macrofossils below the uh, gaseous. That's not something that people have ever really looked for in a lot of detail before. And it's a, a search image now that we intend to uh, follow up and investigate, see if there's anything else down below these horizons. The importance of that is really um, a stratigraphic one. So discussions within the Ediacaran sub Subcommission on how to define and divide up the Ediacaran period. They're focused on a variety of different things, the, the Shuram event being one of those, um, but also the ranges of various different types of fossils amongst these biotas. Paleopascicness is one of those groups, and this data and similar new data from China would suggest that paleopascicnids actually have a much longer range than was previously considered, and so it may not be as useful um, for defining very small scale stages within the EA group. So that's everything I wanted to, to say, really. Um, just to summarize, Newfoundland's Ediacaran biota is more than just a deep water enigma. We are making progress with how to understand it, and it reflects diverse ecosystems at the base of animal evolution. The Rangimorphs are likely total group eumetazoans, and they appear from 574 million years in age. There seems to be independent evidence of movement and of nodarian grade organisms and potentially even of sponges within these settings, which is consistent with early animal evolution being captured by these locations. And the new dates, geochemical records and stratigraphic ranges that I've touched upon here, being worked on by a variety of different authors and groups, are really beginning to allow us to explore the links between these beautiful locations and wider global events and signals. So thank you all for listening, um, and I'm happy to take any questions that you may have. Okay, great. Um, thank you, Alex. Um, uh, I think Paul has uh, already a couple 
a question, Paul, can you unmute yourself and ask? Uh, or should I do something on my end? I think I... Okay. Uh, okay, good. Yeah, I was just curious about the metabolic basis of the deep water forms. And um, if they were living off organic matter that was settling in through the water column, why wasn't the organic matter uh, respired at intermediate depths? I, I suppose maybe this is just an indication of, um, of uh, deep water anoxia, but I, I'm wondering what your, what your thoughts are about uh, uh, the metabolic basis of these communities. Uh, incidentally, I thought it was absolutely outstanding uh, presentation full of, uh, of old and new data. Thank you. Um, okay, so in terms of metabolisms, um, there's a variety of different options and they're not resolved yet. So originally these were thought to be filter feeding organisms when they were first described, but in the absence of any evidence for any sort of pores or filter filtration um, organs within them, it's been suggested that actually they can't be. And so the leading hypothesis for many years has been that they're osmotropes, so they're absorbing dissolved organic carbon through their outer membranes and their tissues. There are also problems with that though, and Nick Butterfield had a paper last year, I think, where he's outlined all of the problems in terms of fluid dynamics that you have with these things being osmotropes and absorbing dissolved organic material from outside of their bodies. His suggestion was that maybe they could function as osmotropes, but if they're actually absorbing that material on the inside, so you have to have some sort of hole somewhere in the organism to allow fluid in, and then it's captured, and then you've, you've got that organic material able to be absorbed across those membranes. So that's where we're at in terms of the, the obvious hypotheses. There is a, an alternative one, and that's a suggestion that these are symbiotic in some way. So biotrophy has been proposed. Uh, Duncan McElroy's group in Newfoundland has suggested that they may have some sort of symbiotic relationship with sulfur bacteria in the sediment. And so their presence on those microbial mats and their high surface areas may be a functional um, adaptation to dealing with processing sulfide from beneath them and oxygen above them and, and trying to metabolize on that basis. So what we ideally need to test between these hypotheses is some isotopic data, which we don't have yet. Um, and any evidence for much finer scale resolution of the external morphologies of these organisms to see whether there is any evidence for pores or water entrance and exit systems that would allow them to function in any of those different ways. Thank you. Okay. So maybe I can ask Alex uh, while uh, other people come in with questions. Uh, I actually has, have two questions. So one, uh, uh, the oldest fossils that you have at 570 and older were in deep water setting. And uh, what are your thoughts in terms of uh, did uh, this complex organism evolve in deep water setting or why we don't see shallow water uh, equivalent for them? Uh, because we would expect life to evolve in shallow water and expand to deep water. And in, uh, with this, um, uh, your paleopasthichnus uh, below the gaskers, is it in shallow water fishes or deep water fishes? Okay, so the, the gaskers paleopasthichnus are in shallow water facies. Okay. Um, so we've got the facies that they're found in are very fine grained purple mudstones and siltstones in a section of very large uh, sandstones up to a meter in thickness, which seem to be just slate, well, not even slate deposits, um, shelf deposits um, related to storm events. So we think that we're quite shallow for those. In terms of your first question, did life evolve in deep water? 
The evidence at the moment all suggests that the oldest Ediacaran fossils we have are in deep water settings. There's always been the, the question of, well, do we actually have any shallow water old settings with which to compare? The Shuram dating recently actually helps us with that because it now suggests that places where we do have evidence for the Shuram anomaly, such as Amman, such as the Wanaka Formation of South Australia, which are practically unfossiliferous in terms of, of where the, the excursion is taking place, those are in shallower settings. The Wanaka, not so much because it, it seems to also be a slope turbidity environment. But it does open up these new windows of, of shallow water environments where we can now look to see if we have any evidence for taxa in those environments. But at present, yes, you're right, the, the evidence does seem to suggest we only have them in deeper settings at this time interval. The one um, caveat to that, though, would be the Lanshan biota in China, which is even older potentially than this. It's not dated, but the authors have suggest that it's maybe 600 million years in age. There are unusual macroscopic forms there. There's only, I think, five taxa named so far, four or five from that location. But potentially that is older and potentially that is a, a shallower water environment. Um, someone like uh, Yuan Jin Lai would be a good person to ask about. I have a question, if I may. Sure. Yes. Uh, well, it was very elegant talk and compilation and interpretation of the Diakaran biota from Newfoundland and related areas. And um, what about the Lantian biota, which are around 620 million years, and there is a swell, uh, perhaps Kindarian type of organisms. What do you think about this? Those are very interesting specimens, and I agree that the Lanchan is probably the, the frontier area of Ediacaran that I think deserves or warrants more attention in recent in coming years. Um, there are structures and, and specimens in there that do seem to be very Nidarian like in their form, conical forms which have sort of flexible tentacle like structures emanating out of the top of their cup shaped bodies. I can see why people suggest that they may be Nidarian. Um, there's not quite enough evidence to be absolutely convinced by it yet, but I personally don't think that there's a problem with them being Nidarian or of Nidarian grade in rocks of that age, if, if they are found to have more evidence that is convincing to suggest that. So yes, I mean, I, it doesn't really answer your question. How do they relate to the, the Newfoundland forms? I'm not entirely sure. They, they look entirely different. The only Newfoundland form we have, which is vaguely similar, would be Thectardis because of its conical shape and the TARDIS specimens don't show any evidence for anything coming out of their tops. So yes, it's a puzzle and one that I can't, can't uh, explain at the moment. May I continue with the question? What is your opinion after the dust settle <laughs> about those conical and tubular fossils from mm, Arctic Norway? Yes, so you're referring to specimens, just for anyone else who, who's not aware of them, of specimens from Finnmark. And these are tubular and seemingly biomineralized in silica. And if I'm right, it's a paper that was published last year. So these are rare specimens in terms of we don't find anything like them anywhere else around the world, seemingly from cold water settings. Um, I can't remember, Magujati, you might be able to remind me if these are shallow or deep. I, I yes, can't remember. Shallow water, not yeah. very deep. But they do seem to be mineralized and they're preserved now as silica. Um, yeah. The question is whether that's silica is a replacement of original biominerals, whether it is original silica that we're seeing preserved, whether this is some sort of soft bodied or organic walled specimens that are um, secondarily solidified. And the other question is how old they actually are. Um, they're intriguing, is, is my answer. So you remember I reviewed 
well, was involved in editing that at one point. I didn't review it. But um, yes, I I thought they were very interesting specimens. I'd love to see the, the actual material at some point. My main concern would be about their age. So I think... But would you accept them as animals? I would accept them as fossils. I don't think I'd accept them as animals yet, but then I wouldn't accept most Ediacaran fossils as animals either <laughs> at this point. <laughs> Well, to speak about the age of those fossils, we have now uh, isotopic dating of the succession, and we are coming with very accurate age, and it seems that they are even older than originally believed. They may be time equivalent to this Lantian biota. Wow, okay. Well, that's very exciting. I look yeah. forward to seeing you. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, Eva Spooken uh, had a comment or question. Uh, Eva, do you want to uh, to present it, or should I read? Uh, yeah, it might be easier if I if I say. So um, I was wondering. So when you when you mentioned the um, the sort of possible coincidence there with the Schirm excursion, um, so um, I just kind of remember, remember that. So not and I don't um, I don't work on this really, but. Uh, I think some of, one of one of the ideas for the Schirm excursion is that um, it's related to a lot of dissolved organic carbon in the water column, um, and so when you mentioned that perhaps these these ediacarans could be maybe an absorbing organic carbon, um, so I wondered if that's if that could be a linkage there that perhaps the ediacarans emerged during the Schirm because of the organic carbon, and so if that could then maybe help us explain or understand why the Schirm excursion occurred in the first place, or or on the other hand, if they're post dating the Schirm, perhaps that's because they're they are kind of removing all this DOC from the water column. So I wondered if, so maybe people that may have worked on this as I said, I'm not, I'm not really up to date probably on the literature, but just curious if you have any thoughts. So yes, I think this, it is possible that, that that scenario plays out. So it could be that the, the organisms evolved in response to a change in ocean chemistry. It could be that the evolution of those organisms led to a change in ocean chemistry and dissolved organic carbon in the water, particularly if the organisms were actively taking that organic carbon out of the water column in, in their feeding mechanisms. The thing I would caution against is first, as I was showing, there seems to be discrepancy in the dating of exactly when, when this event took place. And so I'd be cautious about trying to, to say too much about what a cause or a consequence of this is at this point. Second is the Shuram has also in the past been related to a variety of other biological events, including biomineralization and the evolution of burrowing, things which it now is completely decoupled from, um, and also environmental events like the Gaskias, which it's also, as, as recognized by our ingredients paper, is now decoupled from. So I think, yes, as a, as a mechanism, there are certainly biological mechanisms that could interact with the ocean chemistry to lead to an excursion. Mm -hmm. I would want to, to be sure of the age of that excursion before going too far with mm -hmm. down the route of actually um, explaining it or trying yeah, to. Yeah, so I guess I wondered more if you could, um, I guess uh, if you could maybe constrain sort of like a metabolic rate for these ediacarans. So if you can, if you can tell from the, I guess, sedimentation rate, and I don't know, that might be completely impossible, but if you could say, I guess, how much carbon they were sequestering as they were growing and if, you know, do some sort of, I know, back on the envelope calculation to work out what the impact on the carbon cycle could have been. Um, yeah, um, as far as I'm aware, that hasn't been done to this point. It would be interesting to do and it would be interesting to run in, in all of the models of feeding, as I mentioned in answer to Paul's question earlier. So if they were osmotropes, if they were filter feeders, if they were thiotropes and, and not using DOZ at all, what would their impact be? The other thing I, I'm interested in is what happens to them when they're dead. So we uh, we had a paper in 2011 where there's a certain group of structures that you find on Ediacaran seafloors called Ives hediomorphs. Um, it's a long word for basically pizza-like blobs on the surface. These are regular arrangements of lobes and lumps, which never have the same sort of morphology to any other. Um, and they seem to show this gradation to really nicely preserved specimens. And so our interpretation was that those are the dead bodies, effectively, of organisms that have died on the seafloor 
lie there and in the absence of biotopators or predation or scavenging, they're just going to rot on the seafloor. But we're finding those being preserved um, in, in the sedimentary record. And so you could argue that if you evolve macroscopic organisms, then you're also going to be burying large chunks of carbon for the first time in a way that you haven't done before. Um, there are problems with that, that model and whether or not that carbon that's buried would then be removed from the system completely or whether it would find its way back to the surface through microbial processing. But it's another alternative to, it's not just feeding that these organisms would have been doing, even just being there and, and then dying and being buried is something that could potentially have affected these uh, well, the carbon cycle at this point in a way that it hadn't been affected before. Oh, thanks. So Alex, maybe to continue on this question, maybe I misunderstood or missed your point, but does your dating imply or open possibility that there are multiple negative carbon isotope excursion like Shuram with uh, have uh, different ages or did they completely miss your point? Um, I think from the, the data presented by Camfield et al, there is one major excursion in the Newfoundland sections mm -hmm. and the dating done by Jack Matthews is of those same Newfoundland sections. So maybe not a, the precise exact locality that was sampled, but the same formations within 30 or 40 kilometers of the sampling location. So if those dates are, are accurate and they're uranium led TIM states, so they're as good as they can be effectively, um, in my opinion, <laughs> um, and my collaborators' opinions, then it would suggest that there really is one, um, one signal recorded in Newfoundland, and it is of that slightly younger age. How that then relates to the global uh, carbon cycle is the next question. And so Newfoundland has always been interpreted as being an open ocean setting. So it should be recording global signals. Um, the, some other sites around the world, including China, for example, there have been questions raised in the past about whether or not they're truly open ocean settings. Um, but Newfoundland does seem to have been. And then if that's the case, then there should be, well, one signal being recorded there is indicative of one signal or one event taking place. The one thing to caution against, of course, is that these are plastic rock carbonate measurements rather than coming from carbonate sediments themselves. And so it is a slightly unusual system. Um, well, not unusual, but a non-traditional system. And I'm not an expert in the geochemistry of it to, to be able to go into detail about exactly what that could do to interpretation of the data. Thank you. Oh, uh, Heather, uh, I think has a question. Yeah, go ahead, Heather. Hi, Alex. Uh, thank you so much for a lovely talk. Um, just a quick question uh, on stratigraphy. In the strata below the gas skiers, uh, do you find any branching paleopocycnids or just chain forms? We found a sort of cluster of specimens which you you could argue are branching in that the, the several overlapping and, and amalgamating chains. It's just that they're so dense in that part of the specimen that we can't be absolutely sure that they truly are branched and coming from one single chamber. Um, the vast majority, I think there are about 40 samples, and I'd say at least 30 of them are all single chains, unbranched. And then there's this cluster, which may be one big cluster of a branching type, or it may be um, several overlapping specimens. Does that help? Yeah, thanks. I, I wasn't sort of thinking if there are, if there are any differences, uh, taxonomic differences between the branching forms that appear to be quite abundant um, sort of after 565 million years. Uh, but it's interesting that you see that diversity earlier. Yes, so I think Anton Kolesnikov in uh, Moscow has just had a paper on paleopascinids and their, their variation through time. So uh, that might be something else to look at. 
Great. Uh, any other questions for Alex? Yeah, this is very exciting stuff. Thank you. No, it's, uh, it's got a lot of people working on it at the moment. So as I said, um, Memorial University, Queen's University in Canada. Um, and there were new groups as well who were just starting out before the pandemic hit. So um, yeah, hopefully yeah. all of these discoveries will spur more investigation and there's plenty of rocks out there to look at. So lots more to discover. Okay, uh, well, if we totally run out of question, thanks, Alex, for excellent presentation. And uh, uh, Alex uh, will put it on on a, on a web in a few days, uh, so it will be available for everyone. And uh, uh, again, uh, next week we will have a talk by Desiree Rodlink on Arcane Barrett's and announcement should go out today or tomorrow. So thanks everyone and talk to you next week. Bye. Thank you. Thank you and bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Daryl. Bye, Daryl. Bye. 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 Bye.